So welcome everybody. Um, my name is uh, Craig Katinas. I am the alumni director at Archbishop <coughs> High School. Um, it is such a delight to have you all join us here for the Stanner Talks with Brother Ben Consegli, uh, class of 1980. Um, I just have to say it's a delight um, with having you all here tonight, Brother Ben, on um, behalf of President Karsten, the Maris brothers, which you are, but uh, with, for being here tonight, for sharing your time and your talents and your insights, uh, we're truly grateful. Um, for those of you, um, to give a brief introduction about Brother Ben, uh, Brother Ben is a former Malloy educator, a former U.S. provincial and current serving member of the Maris Brothers General Council. That's the link for Maris regions of Oceania and Europe. Uh, Brother Ben is joining us from Italy um, for a discussion about his life and service as a Maris brother, as well as some of his writings, which is one of the focal points tonight, the reflection on the pandemic and our Maris mission. Um, with regards to that, um, what we're going to have, uh, we have available for you is if you haven't had the opportunity to take a look at this reflection, uh, we have that available on our events page or you con can contact uh, Joseph Somo or myself or anyone at the Alumni Center and we could send you this PDF uh, to you directly for your reflections. Um, to share with you also, um, what we're going to ask is if all of you, uh, with the exception of brother uh, Ben, uh, is if you could keep your microphones uh, on mute um, so that ambient noise won't be distracting. Um, what we did was we called a bunch of questions that uh, many of you submitted to us um, and what we felt was crafted a nice uh, push-pull dynamic of a conversation. After we go through several of those uh, questions on this reflection journey, um, we will be opening this up uh, for some general questions as well. Um, so with that, um, it is my pleasure again, once again, to welcome Brother Ben. Uh, Brother Ben, thank you so much. Before we get into the questions, if you'd like to open the floor with anything, please do. No, it's, uh, it's certainly great uh, to be here. It's always good to connect with Malloy and my alma mater. Uh, it's also good to uh, see some of the names of people that I know from either former students or former classmates. So I see Tom Colgan there from the class of 80. Thanks for representing Tom. And it's also good to see certainly uh, the Maris brothers, Roy and Mike, uh, who have been very significant in my time uh, as a brother, but I won't go into that now. So good to be here. <laughs> There's a lot of eye rolling there, brother Ben. So I don't think they want to take any credit for anything. Uh, okay. But with, with that, thank you again. Um, and again, for those of you who are going to be really concentrating upon uh, this reflection paper uh, that we had available. And again, we'll have that available uh, at any point of your request. Um, but Brother Ben, the first question that we have for you tonight is, can you share the motivation and the timing of when you began to write this reflection? Okay. Um, probably it all started back, I'm going to go back actually probably March of 2020 when um, we here in Italy began moving towards lockdown when the pandemic was, I think, declared at the end of February. And we had about, here in Rome, we had a meeting of 26 of our provincials from all over the world. So in five or six of the continents were represented here. And once the pandemic was declared and Italy was declared in full lockdown, uh, things kind of went off the rails, so to speak. We had to get 26 men home. And even to this day, one of the provincials is still not back in his province. He's in Brazil. So it's almost two years that he's been out of his province because of the pandemic. And I actually was supposed to be coming to the States for some minor knee surgery. And then I was supposed to be traveling to Australia, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands as part of my work connecting with the brothers and our ministries throughout there. Um, and then everything stopped, everything stopped. And here in Italy, if you recall, prior to the United States becoming the epicenter, uh, Italy was the epicenter and literally uh, every day a thousand people were dying here in Italy. So I would say what began happening for me was 
certainly fear began taking over. Here I am away from home, not too sure what's going to be happening. Uh, a lot of isolation. Uh, I don't speak Italian, even though I've been here for three and a half years. Uh, I was trying to remember the little Italian that my grandparents spoke to me, but it, it was to no avail. Uh, and uh, as word started spreading about all the various deaths, I over just overwhelmed with a feeling of sadness. Um, and for me, what was happening, I couldn't do anything about it. Uh, and probably for one of the first times in my life, I felt totally, totally powerless. And here in Italy, the lockdown really included, you were not allowed to leave your property, your home, your apartment, very small area that you can leave. So whatever, whatever lawn area you had, that's the only place you can go. So for myself, I think there was so, many, so much of a mix of feelings, I really wasn't sure what to do. Um, and so what I began doing, just to stay sane, was on our property here in Rome, we, it's an actually quite a large property. So I would go walking every morning uh, and trying to really clarify, and really, I, I use it as a time to walk with God, quite honestly. Uh, I probably didn't spiritualize it that way in the beginning. I just wanted to get out and do some exercise. Uh, but time and again, I just kept walking and walking. Realized right from the beginning how vulnerable I am and in many ways how fractured I am. And what I mean by that is I think uh, I always felt that I had my act together. But clearly this pandemic showed that I don't think any of us had our acts together on that. Um, and I realized it was part of my human condition, the vulnerability. This is part of who I am. I think it's part of all of our uh, condition as humans. We need nurturing. That's what I kept, as I kept seeing walking. And here in Italy, it was the beginning of winter or movement in winter and then movement towards spring. So it was the sense of a lot of desolation but then beginning a sense of little life as we kept moving. Um, and then as it moved towards it, the idea of what does this mean? What does this mean for me as a person? And then in the ministry that I'm about right now, working with the larger Marist family, what does this mean for our mission? And I really kind of sat with the two types of questions, you know, what can I do and who can I be in the midst of that? So I think that was the big motivation, really feeling, if you'd like, powerless, feeling vulnerable, and trying then to express those feelings with all the questions and not many answers, not many answers. I think we all would like many answers, especially okay. for Brother Roy's chemistry exams, but you know, that's, that's just wishful thinking. But with that, Brother Ben, you know, it's, it's definitely when you're talking about vulnerability. Um, I re recall when we talked about this before, that vulnerability also invited you to be open uh, yeah. to, to new things and new opportunities. And, you know, you and I, we talked about that journey where I, I said to you, I never thought I would dive into meditation. You mm -hmm. know, and meditation, you know, I've been doing for the last year and it's helped you know, unpack and pack things for me, as you said, like, you know, you're fractured, you think you have your stuff together. And then on that reflection, you kind of have a sobering, you know, reality put in front of you that no, you really don't. So when we talk about this, this reflection paper that you created during this real at the apex of the most challenging time for Italy, um, and for all of you that were there, mm -hmm. um, you call on us to recognize, rethink, and reflect on our true priorities. Mm -hmm. In your experiences, what are some of the techniques or approaches or resources you tapped into that perhaps all of us could tap into as well to you know, help us quiet our minds and maybe take those steps, you know, that journey that each of us, you're calling us to do? Yeah. I, you know, I guess part of for me, I would say is that anytime I have these questions in my life, um, 
they do require some type of choices, right? the choice that I'm going to make. And really, you know, choices define who we are and who we have the potential of becoming, all right? Uh, if I, you know, the people that are on this Zoom meeting, if you think of your own life choices, where you went to school, college, marriage, children, jobs, whatever, they always have a potential of leading us in a particular way. In, in our own Marist history, Marcel and Champagne made a choice from the early moments of his career. He decided to live with the brothers. He was a priest. He could have lived in a rectory, much more comfortable existence. He decided to live with the brothers. And that had a, a profound impact from that moment till today. That's one of the reasons why the superior general or the provincial visits all the brothers throughout the province or the institute. We, we have choices that we always have to make. All right? And when we are asked to rethink, reflect, what are our priorities? For me, it's the two questions uh, that I kind of alluded to in the beginning. It was very big at our general chapter four years ago. One question is, who is God asking us to be in this emerging reality? So in the midst of this pandemic, who is God asking me to be? First to be, to be Ben Consigli, to be a Maris brother, or to be uh, a son, to be a, a, a father, a husband, a wife. We're called to this, to be, all right? So what is God asking me to be? And then, what is God asking us, me, to do in this emerging reality? All right. What are we asked to do? And the doing is not so much, as it were, it shouldn't be bigger than the being, but it is even sometimes in many ways, it's small steps. What are these things that we're asked to do? So for me, it kind of led me uh, into, and I think certainly many of the people here have also done this, what is my stance of discernment? All right, we, we use the word discernment in religious life a lot more than I think, but it's really asking us, how, do, how am I a good listener? All right, how do I listen? How do I read the signs of the times? How do I read God? First thing for me, I have to get in touch with what I'm feeling. And that goes back to that, uh, the original question. For me, I needed the time and the space to clarify what I was feeling. All the mixed emotions, the fears, the anxieties, the hopes, and the dreams. All right. And then, for myself, I needed to share that. All right. So I was fortunate here that there are some English-speaking people, mm -hmm. uh, so I could communicate with them uh, easily. Uh, so, in particular, there was one, one guy, another counselor from Australia. We were able literally, and I mean this literally, every night we would gather together. We might have, you know, drink a beer, glass of wine, but we would sit and talk about what was going on in our own lives and our own reflections. So that one big piece was, uh, for me, for the discernment, was getting in touch with what I was feeling. The second piece for me was trying to be in touch with God, all right? And it, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, I tend to think I was in touch with God on my walks in the quiet every morning. I also believe I was in touch with God in my relationships with the brothers here to be able to share what I was feeling, all right? That component of prayer, what I call prayer, which is relationship, relationship with others, relationship with God, was very key, all right? Was very, very key. I, I needed to spend time to what is God revealing about Ben in the midst of this? Uh, and by, by allowing that and engaging in that, sometimes there was absolutely silence and feeling of isolation. But in time, that feeling became much clearer. Uh, what I was thinking, what, what I was being called to, what was God asking in the midst of this, 
it became, you know, little glimmers of light, little glimmers of hope. And it, it allowed for me to say, what are the real priorities in my life? So for me, the question was, how do I let God reveal himself or God's self to me? How do I understand myself? And then what does that mean for me? And therefore, then what are my priorities? What is important? For me, what was very clear, and it goes back even to our general chapter here, we were called to journey as a global family, journey together as a global family. Clearly the pandemic was a global and is a global event. What happens in India is affecting what's happening in Italy, what's happening in the United States, we're all part of this global family. So for me, the priorities really are, how do I connect with not only my own humanity, but the humanity of my brothers and sisters? Yeah. And, and clearly what was happening and still happens. I think we, when, we're, when I'm afraid, I like to surround myself uh, with the wagon, so to speak, circle the wagons around. But really what the pandemic was and is calling me to, to really do and be is to be brother to my brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. to be compassionate with or compassionate for those other people. Because I clearly, by the grace of God, I didn't get sick, but other people did. Wait, wait. Other people died. You know, it was this. Yeah, this movement towards clarifying priorities for me. And and if, if just to kind of blend in, you know, we, we had a, a dry run conversation before this with, with Brother Ben, and we, we, a sobering thing that you were just talking about was the non-essential versus essential, right? Mm -hmm. And everything that we got labeled as a society, are you an essential worker or non-essential right. worker? Yes. And that that's also kind of a, a big you know, hit on, on your realities, uh, mine included, but I thought what was great, how, when we started having this conversation, when you said how you seeked out others where you were, you started having very essential conversations mm -hmm. as opposed to like the, the, you know, how you do in the mundane, you know, checklist of questions that I have a conversation. How are you? How's your day been in this? You know, you were talking about real substantive issues about what's your intention? What happens if you do get sick? What are we going to do for each other? How are we going to look out for each other? Yeah. And I think those are the, the, the reflection points, you know, that I took away from, from the conversation with you and also the paper was distill out the, 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 the noise and mm. really don't be afraid to dive into the scary real questions that are important for yourself and for those that you love and care and you're surrounded by and have that conversation first with yourself and then be brave enough to 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 take the next step and express it to others yeah you know i, but, I, you know, I mean craig I, even for me the initial thing was where is god in the midst of this there's so much suffering so much pain uh, and things just seemed in many ways totally out of control. Um, and so those, those questions became much more essential. Like, what does this mean? What, you know, just being able to share your, your doubts, your fears uh, with another person was, you know, very, very significant for me, certainly. I also dealt with the question of, really being a non-essential worker, totally non-essential, because our, our role as a general counsel is really to accompany provincials by visiting with them, being with them in person, et cetera. Now, what the, what the pandemic did, it tapped into, if we believe that that is essential, being with people, being with the other, well, then how are we going to do it when everything's locked down? Uh, and I think, you know, technology is affording us the opportunity to be in touch and to accompany the best way and have these types of conversations. Because cl clearly for me, for months, as I told the Superior General, the only thing I was clear about was I'm a non-essential worker. Things were moving on. 
if anything, without me, you know? So what does that mean? And that, that was, you know, a question that I took to heart, but then I was trying to understand it in light of the Marist Institute, the Marist Congregation, our Marist mission, uh, which most of the people here are products of that Marist mission. So what did that mean for me? And, you know, that was, those were the things that were coming to the fore for me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because one of the things that we did touch upon uh, prior to this call was about the need, you know, or the open conversation society is having about mental health. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it used to be a shameful discussion for many, but it was like we talked about, like St. Francis Hospital Long Island is known for the heart hospital and all the other medical lines, maybe other medical lines, but you could be an OBGYN or whomever else, but you're attuned to the heart. And I feel that, you know, from a Marist standpoint, um, Marist has always had that focus of being attuned to the heart. And you see that with guidance and all of these things. And, you know, it's funny when you get behind the scenes as from an alum, a student to an alum to working in that environment, mm -hmm. you're seeing teachers talk to counselors about concerns for the kids. It's, you know, you thought they would, <laughs> they're talking about the kids and be like, well, oh, these kids, which is natural. And I feel like it's almost, you know, unveiling this self, you know, like it's, it's, it's almost like giving you the behind the scenes of like, we should be having this discussion more readily and present for all of us to talk about our vulnerabilities, to have almost peer groups with our loved ones. You know, how many times have we had that really nourishing and sincere conversation, you know, with your, with your family, with your cousins, with your, you know, for me, my wife and, and my kids. Uh, uh, it's, it's to, you know, take the opportunity to not be afraid to, to be, you know, vulnerable to show the weakness and and be empathetic to what they're going through as well. That was yeah. a takeaway that I learned from you when you said with the brothers that you were having those very deep conversations with on a nightly basis about that. Yeah, and and I think you know I I, I think it also calls us to do move even beyond more than even the the empathy and compassion. I think the empathy and compassion for me was a way to, to try to connect with other people. So, you know, if I look at throughout our, our institute, all of our schools were locked down, totally locked down. And some still are, they, they have not reopened. So what the pandemic is also doing is challenging our, our creativity. Uh, and if we believe in our priority of you know, the education, the Christian education of young people, especially those in need. Well, how do we reach out to them where they are at that point? It might not be in a, a particular formal educational setting, but many of our schools became and still are hubs to distribute food uh, because this is a general need. In many of our places where the brothers are ministering and lay Maris are ministering, uh, the people, the poorer people work off either tourism or they work literally off the streets selling small goods. But if people are locked in, those small economies die. People can't afford to live. So what actions can we do? How can we reimagine? And this was the, the question. How can we re what type of world do we want to be? How can we reimagine what happens? And, and really, it, it began clarifying what it really means for me, this is me personally, to be brother. What did that mean? Now, I have the title brother, but I think we're called, each of us are called to brother, to be brother or sister to someone else. So for me, it was very, very, it really clarified and, and if you'd like, knocked away any pretense uh, of what this is all about. It, it really is about the human family. And I think that's Pope Francis, when he speaks in his encyclical, you know, Fratelli Tutti, brothers and sisters all, what does this mean for us? Um, even though we were in lockdown here in our general house, we have uh, three uh, migrants, uh, people who who fled their homelands, and through the Catholic agency Caritas, we we work with them, we house them here, etc. For us, that was a very, very real way of connecting with the outside world. 
uh, mm. you know, besides the brothers that live here, you know, we're, we're kind of in our little enclave, but we really were able to connect also with these three, three men, all different ages, yeah. you know, in their 40s, one in his 40s, one in his 20s, 119. You know, right. what does this all mean? Yeah, I'm Wait, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, it's all good. Because, you, you know, when we talked about um, discernment and, and intent, and what, what I love is that you're, you're telling us to really, or, or re guide us on the reflection of, you know, intention can create a spectrum, healthy uh, behaviors or harmful behavior. Mm -hmm. And what's beautiful about this reflection is you're at, the journey is, the intention is to be in the healthy spectrum, mm -hmm. you know, with our minds, hearts, and spirits to be on that healthy spectrum. And mm -hmm. if you could kind of share about that, you know, where you went through this journey, and I thought it was really interesting, some of the points that you shared about how you're taking advantage of the opportunity with your intent now, um, with the the uh, with all of the the vest, you know, uh, if you would normally be traveling, you would be traveling. You'd only be spending this much fraction of a time with you know a, a certain section of of the brothers that you came to visit, and how that's becoming. You're taking advantage of what's being put before you as a instead of becoming a victim of it. Like you're having much more deeper dialogues, much more deeper conversations. So you could take us through that you know, journey of the intention. Yeah, I think certainly part for me, um, I, 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 we don't journey alone. Uh, now, maybe there are some, some times in our lives where we feel we're journeying alone, uh, but we, we really don't journey alone. So for me, the journey helps clarify what my intention would be. So when, you, when, you, when I think of a journey, uh, I think of it as, I may have a goal in mind of where I want to reach, but really the learnings are in the journey, uh, the movement forward, hopefully. Sometimes it doesn't seem like you're moving forward, but the experience kind of propels you forward. For me, it does at least. Um, so for me, it, it demanded the journey. What is, what is my intention? Am I here to make things better or make things worse. I know that sounds simplistic, mm -hmm. but, but for me, the intention is how do I make things better? Um, I could certainly get bogged down in complaining or a pity party, woe is me, uh, but that is not necessarily gonna make things better. What it will do is, at least for me, it's part of my journey of like letting go of some baggage because I have to let go of something to let come something else. And for me, the intention was always, what am I learning from this? What are we learning from this that I can help make at least some part of the world better? Um, and that was this, this creative reimagining, if you like, of what things can be. Uh, you know, so for me, the journey was I'm stepping out, trying to find out what, what's going on, either with me, with the, those around me. I'm not going alone. The journey will eventually and does change me. All right. And then it asks me to re, if you'd like, re-understand, revisit what has happened so that I could go on the journey again, another journey. So for me, the, the, this clarity of intention came and is still coming with this process of a journey. Um, I don't know if I could make that any clearer. I was trying to, trying to think of what might be a, a, a metaphor uh, in this. I guess the journey tells me that I'm not alone. The journey tells me that there's a common fraternity, if you'd like. Um, it kind of unites us and it's the essence of the gospel uh, because this common fraternity really leads to love, you know, care, deep care, deep concern. Um, and so for me, the intention was, am I a bridge builder or do I put up walls? Am I a healer or do I cause illness? Those were the things that kind of clarified for me intention. 
We only have a certain amount of time in life. Yeah. What's my intention? And I will say, I'm going to paraphrase you did, I think, kind of hit it really well in the paper. If you forget what you wrote, I'm going to paraphrase for you. It was, I love how your the summation was, our response is Maris to this pandemic demands that we're intentional in the way we exercise our, the influence and responsibility invested in us. And wow. I appreciated that um, because too often in this disposable society, the responsibility falls upon, that's not my problem. As you just said before, oh, it's happening in India, it's not my problem, or this is not my problem, and that's not my problem. And I think it's beautiful how you're making very clear, listen, it's that's your brother and sister, it's our problem. Mm -hmm. you know, we're all suffering. The pandemic has put a lens that we all are going through this, we're not alone. So knowing that, that we're all connected this way, you know, let's let's be responsible to each other. Let's help each other. Let's be the tide, if you will, to raise the ships as opposed to sink them. Right. And, and you know, I think uh, I wrote this also with a, a, a look towards the leadership. You know, part of it was we're supposed to be accompanying the, 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 those 26 leaders throughout our institute and, and leadership clearly matters. But the, the question is, we're all, or not question, the, the fact is we're all leaders. So uh, what is our intention in our daily lives? Literally, for me here, especially in lockdown, uh, now we're moving out of it, but it, every morning, what is my intention? That was part of my prayer every morning, to ask for clarity in that intention, to listen to maybe hearing uh, God in the midst of those around me, in the nature around me. Um, in, you know, going through the seasons uh, of nature for me was also very, very healing. In the midst of the dying of winter, you move towards the birth and new life coming in. It was uh, very, very significant. And I consider myself, I mean, clearly an enormous amount of gratitude in the midst of that in the midst of really the craziness and the horrors of this pandemic, I do have gratitude yeah. for the, these, you know, these almost self-knowledge time to be, and then look towards time to do. Yeah, it's, uh, again, if, if you haven't read this, uh, this reflection, I highly encourage it. It was uh, very inspirational for um, uh, President Karsten, myself, and, and many others he shared this with, that was the impetus of, of having Brother Ben on this call. And I want to end on some questions, other questions, Brother Ben, some one-to-ones. Sure. This will be like, uh, you know, the, the actor's studio, you know, where, where we have the, the, the questions in the blue card for us uh, that were submitted. So here's some light ones, and then uh, we'll wrap it up with that, opening it to a couple of questions. If anybody wants to put it in the chat, uh, the chat section that I could look at. Um, if you have a question or two that we haven't covered, uh, please let us know. Please also know that this, whatever happens today, we're going to have an ongoing dialogue. So please feel free to share your thoughts, your reflections. Uh, we want to keep this as a dynamic conversation, not a static conversation. Uh, this recording will be available for your self-reflection as well. Um, but so let's get into some fun questions. So what is your proudest accomplishments to date? Wow. Um, actually, uh, for me, I, it's, it's hard to say. Really, my, one of my pr I enjoyed teaching. I really, I would say that was probably my proudest accomplishment. You know, my, my family may have other accomplishments that they think that I should be proud of. But uh, for me, uh, teaching, working with young people uh, has always been an enormous grace for me. And I've uh, always pined to, to go back to it. <laughs> uh, I don't always get that opportunity uh, to do it. But I'd say my proudest accomplishment was teaching and teaching at my alma mater. I enjoyed, I loved teaching at Malloy, working with people that taught me, uh, the brothers that taught me. So it was a, a good way of coming home uh, in many ways. Oh, that's great. And, and you know, I, I would just say this, I want this on recording. It will make brother Roy and brother Mike laugh. Who's your favorite Katinas? 
<laughs> Craig Katinas, of course. Oh, there you go. That's the best. And I have Brother Mike approving that. Brother Roy shaking his head, not so much. Not so much. <laughs> the honest one. <laughs> um, the other you know, part. You know, what's, what's a little, Craig, what's a little scary here is that my first dean of discipline, Brother Roy, is here, and my sophomore religion teacher, Brother Mike, is here. So I'm a little concerned about what questions may come your way here. So, <laughs> so. I love it. So another great question that was brought up, and you know, you alluded to it as a teacher. It's one of your favorite accompli- one of your proudest accomplishments. You know, one of the questions we got, and you know, we even at Malloy still struggle with. We want to make sure we're there for the kids, but in particular during this pandemic, what advice do you have for parents um, for, to help their children during this? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, certainly I'm not a parent, so I, I'm coming at it from a different thing, but I think it's whatever way you can keep those young people from being isolated. And the pandemic, as I said, it could create really tough isolations. So even if it's, um, having them connect by Zoom with other people, their family members uh, in some way, shape or form. If when things begin opening up or have opened up, if you're able to even go for walks in the neighborhood with masks, I think those types of connections are very, very, very important. Uh, I think certainly parents innately know that And certainly when your children become adolescents, they do not want to be with their parents. So you have to have creative ways of trying to connect with them. Um, And, you know, I'm certainly, I would open it up to the variety of parents on this uh, Zoom chat that probably could give a lot better advice. But I think it's the idea of breaking down the isolation. Yeah. So, So I think it would be, as we wrap this up, um, first, if everybody can join me and and thanking Brother Ben so much um, for this beautiful reflection and journey that we've we've been on for the last uh, forty minutes or so. So thank you, Brother Ben. This was great. Um, I think it would only be appropriate that you know the power of prayer does, and I think if anything, this year put a lens on how important it is in our lives. So I would love if you could lead us out in a thoughtful, reflective prayer. I know I just put you on the spot, surprise. Um, but I think it would be only fitting for what we've just experienced the, on this uh, Stanner Talks. Okay, I, I mean, I, how I always for myself begin the prayer is just take a moment of, of some silence uh, and asking God uh, to, to reveal God's self to me in the moment. God, who is father and mother to all of us, we ask for your continued guidance. Help us to know that you are close to us by your presence in those we love and in those we meet. May we always journey together, recognizing your presence in our midst. And we ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to be uh, not overstepping saying that we are eternally grateful to you, Brother Roy, Brother Mike, and all of the brothers uh, that have always been walking with us on our journey, not just in the four years that we've been at Malloy, but our lives. Um, I feel we're very blessed to have an order of of men and women that are truly dedicated to our hearts. Um, and I feel very blessed that we have you in our lives. God calls people to go to certain places and certain things. I think, you know, Brother Terrence would say, God bless all Stanners. And I think God did bless Stanners to have that opportunity to walk into that building and experience the Marist mission and the Marist charism. So thank you three so much. Thank you to all the brothers. Uh, we're just so blessed. We're so grateful for your time, your talents. Again, I'm highly encouraging. If you haven't read this reflection paper, please do. Brother Ben, forgive me, I forgot my note on it. There are a bunch of other resources that people could tap into. What was the website for the Maris Brothers? Yeah, it's uh, champagne.org. All right, Marcel and Champagne, but it's champagne.org. And there's a number of articles and resources that are on the website. 
Uh, and I just, before we finish, I'd be remiss to say, I just want to say hello to my cousin, Irene, uh, who is back in the States, back in upstate New York. I think I'm still up in upstate New York and to the guys from the class of 80 and my former students. So thank you all. Uh, and I leave it all to you guys. Thanks again. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And may all of you have the great uh, rest of the week. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.